What is up, guys and dolls? We are coming at you from the glorious Impala Films headquarters in sunny South End on Sea. It is the end of 2023, and that means it is the end, the season finale of the first season, the inaugural season of Second Take Cinema. Now, knowing that we were going to do a season finale, I thought to myself, we need to pick a film that's worthy of a second chance. A film with a nostalgia factor, a film that was well liked, a film that was seen by all, and a film that actually probably doesn't deserve the reputation it has. Ladies and gentlemen, lace up your sneakers, put on your basketball vests. It's time for Space Jam. <laughs> That's right, ladies and gentlemen, today we are taking a nostalgia fueled trip back to ye old year of 1996 to watch an American live action slash animated sports comedy, Space Jam. This was an absolute titan of a movie when I was a child. So I was five when this came out. Five years old. What year was it? 1996. Yeah, I was 10. I turned six at the end of the year. Yeah. I was 10. I remember it was huge. It I was always wanted massive. to see it. I there didn't w- get to, though. There was a cross promotion with Walker's Crisps. And Nike. Where you got the little um, uh, pogs, were they called? What, the caps that you smacked into each other? or No, these ones, they had slits in the side. And you could join them together to oh. build things. Oh, that wasn't pogs. I don't remember what they were I, called. Oh, I know the ones you mean. Yes. Yes, I had some of them. Yeah, they were they Looney Tunes yeah, ones. they're not pogs. I can't remember what they I think they just were given them. No, no. You, could, you could also basically play tiddlywinks with them. Yeah. Um, it was everywhere, this movie. it was. I remember seeing the trailer a billion times. I saw posters. This was... Do you know what? This was probably the first movie that I remember having a huge marketing campaign. Yeah. Bear in mind, we're in the UK. We don't even get the NBA, uh, yeah, the NBA over here. Not really. Not, not unless you have like the unique channels on Sky. Yeah, you actually have to pay for like the sports channels yeah, specifically. For ESPN8, the yeah. old show. But no, nobody, yeah, nobody sits there and goes, Be- on today on the BBC, we're watching the NBA. No, we, we prefer a much better sport. We, you know, a much more manly sport. Where what, people where... <laughs> fake ankle injuries constantly. Yeah, and cry like little bitches. Football. Football. Or as the Americans like to call it, soccer. I mean, soccer is also the correct name. Yeah, it's either way, it's garbage. But also, football... Play some fucking rugby. <laughs> it's also... Like, football is also a more accurate name for soccer than it is for American football. Because, because they use, use your hands. Yeah. Whereas you're not allowed to use your hands except unless you're the goalie mm. in soccer. So it is much more football. At least basketball makes sense. The yeah. aim of the game is put the ball in the basket. Yes. It's just exactly what it says on the tin. Let's be honest, neither of us are sporty. Neither of us are sport, sporty type people. If we were sporty, we would not be doing this show. My biggest sport influence is pro wrestling, which is obviously more drama than it is sport. I mean... And your biggest sport reference is running for a bus on a Saturday night. <laughs> so anyway, this is Space Jam from 1996. It is directed by Joe Pitka, written by Leo Benevenuti, Steve Rudnick, Timothy Harris and Herschel Weingrod. And of course, infamously stars basketball player Michael Jordan, perhaps the greatest of all time. As Certainly far as the biggest of his era. Definitely the biggest at the time. I think I think he still very much is a contender for the title of greatest of all time. Yes. I think the general consensus, well, put it this way, on uh, what they call family fortune, family feud in America. Yeah. 
uh, I saw a clip where they did, you know, obviously they go and poll an audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They polled an audience for the greatest basketball player of all time. Michael Jordan was number one, followed by LeBron James and Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Um, obviously, Kobe Bryant sadly died a couple of years ago. Oh, did he? Uh, I didn't yeah, know helicopter. Yeah, oh, yeah, very sad. Him and his son, I think. Heli- helicopter crash, yeah. Real sad. Uh, not very old either. Uh, I was surprised Shaq wasn't on there, because Shaq's a name I heard from. To be fair, though, Shaq... Lot. Shaq, was Shaq any good though? Who could say? Well, I think Shaq was good at basketball, but he he was mostly well known for his martial arts career, <laughs> such all as those, in Shaq Fu. All those Adam Sandler comedy movies he does. I was thinking more Shaq Fu on the yeah. Mega Drive. It's oh, on the SNES as well. If you've, you, we're like the BBC. There are other competitors available for Shaq Fu. Yes, there is also um, a modern Shaq Fu game. There's a sequel. Why? And I have it. Why? It's not very good. <laughs> of course it's not. But it's also different. Shaq Fu 1 was a one-on-one fighter like Mortal Kombat. Where well, you played Sha- as Shaq. Yeah. Shaq Fu 2, you still only play as Shaq, but it's more like a, a Streets of Rage style game where you beat up multiple people. That sounds a little better. Let's be honest. At least it's tongue in cheek, so it knows what it is. Let's be honest, it's never good when celebrities make games of themselves. No. I direct your attention to the 50 Cent video game. But to relate it to this film... The first Shaq Fu game has blatant Pepsi advertising, as does this film. Hey, Pepsi. Uh, The film also stars Wayne Knight and Teresa Randall, as well as a cameo appearance by Bill Murray and several NBA players, uh, including Charles Barkley. I think Larry Bird was in it as well. Yeah. Um, While Billy West, Dee Bradley Baker, Kath Suchi and Danny DeVito headline the voice cast. Yeah, I was 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 surprised at Billy West because I was like, he normally does voices. But yeah, yeah, fine. Billy West most famously uh, basically kind of plays himself when he plays Fry in Futurama. Right. He's the main character of Futurama. Um, And basically he he made it so he can't not be the main character because it's... Almost entirely based on him, <laughs> right? But yeah, he's he's a he's also a master with his voice, so he can do multiple right. different voices. And he ha- again, he has done Looney Tunes for many years, including this film. Okay, mm. who does he play? Do you know? I have no idea. We'll look it up later. Um, uh, this comes in at a nice tight eighty-eight minute runtime. It had a budget of eighty million dollars. How much? Eighty million eight oh. zero and made a whopping two hundred and fifty point two million, which is nothing compared to its merchandising uh, earnings, yeah. which was one point four billion as of two thousand and nine. Well, we we're we, now in twenty twenty three. So I mean, we on our sister show VGMP, we kind of had a, something similar, but nowhere near on this scale with Tron, where. You know, the Tron sales didn't quite make it hold its budget back, but Tron as a property made shed loads of cash, mostly from merchandising and largely the arcade game rights sales. Uh, it seems like, whereas this made a shed ton of money at the cinema first and then went on to make even more in merchandising. So, uh, you asked me who Billy West plays. Billy West plays Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd in oh, this movie. Oh, there you go. Uh, so it's not Mel Blanc. I think Mel Blanc probably was dead by this point. He may have done, or he may have retired. Yeah. Um, D. Bradley Baker was Daffy Duck and the Tasmanian Devil. Mm. Danny DeVito was obviously the main villain. Swackhammer, which I did not get that name at all in the entire thing. Well, I don't think they named the villains by name in the movie. No. Not is it like they're just the, the is it the Morons? Uh, Moron Mountain, they're called the Monstars. Right. Yeah, but he's not, no. Monstars was the name of the team. Yeah. But he's not a monster. He's no, the he guy runs Moron of... Mountain. Yeah, but we don't. Yeah, again, we don't get his name. We don't get no, his sure president I'm sure, or what. I'm sure they only ever refer to him as the boss. Yeah, but yeah, anyway. not, not deep on lore is Space Jam. <laughs> um, so I'm just looking up Kath Suchi, who played Lola Bunny. She's most known for playing Lola Bunny and also playing Linka in Captain Planet and the Planeteers. Oh, hang! On. Did you say Kath Suchi? Kath Suchi, yeah. Uh, she also played Fifi LaFlume and Lil Sneezer in Tiny Toon Adventures, Minx in Gem, B in Mighty Max, and Dexter's mom in Dexter's Laboratory. Yeah, she's been in loads oh, of stuff, Kath Suchi. She's Princess Sally Acorn in Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, that's where I know the name from. Who could possibly care? Because that's a non canon character, so let's move on. She also plays Cubert Farnsworth non- in Futurama. Character can- non canon character. Who no, Cubert Farnsworth is canon. No. Sally Acorn is not canon. Oh, not yeah. canon. 
anyway, so critical reception. Uh, uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, Space Jam holds an approval rating of 43% based on 86 reviews, mm -hmm. with an average rating of 5.3 out of 10. Critical consensus reads, while it's no slam dunk, Space Jam's silly Looney Tunes laden slapstick and vivid animation will leave younger viewers satisfied, though accompanying adults may be more annoyed than entertained. Um... Audiences polled by CinemaScore gave the film an average grade of an A minus. Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel of the Chicago Sun Times and Chicago Tribune both gave Space Jam a thumbs up, although Siskel's praise was more reserved. In his review, Ebert gave the film three and a half stars and noted Space Jam is a happy marriage of good ideas, three films for the price of one, giving us a comic treatment of the career adventures of Michael Jordan, crossed with a Looney Tunes cartoon and some showbiz warfare. The result is a delightful is a, is delightful a family movie in the best sense, which means adults will enjoy it too. Siskel focused much of his praise on Jordan's performance, saying he was he's what he wisely accepted as a first movie, a script that builds nicely on his genial personality in an assortment of TV ads. The sound bites are just a little bit longer. I ca I can't agree with these two. No, if I'm being honest. Uh, <laughs> I I've never accused Roger Ebert of this before, but I think someone was paid off for this yes. movie. Or, or maybe um, maybe to be fair. To be fair, it could be a payoff thing, but more more po possibly, without it needing to be corruption, could be that he watched it with his kids and they really enjoyed it. Uh, no, it I, I'm, I'm guessing as well, but it, it seems a little bit like that's too much praise from a couple mm. of guys who are generally known to be quite well on the pulse of reviews. Yeah. Now, obviously, people will disagree with stuff, but a lot of the comedy doesn't land in this, and... Let's be honest, Michael Jordan's performance is not great. No, although there are caveats to that that we'll get to later. Yeah, 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 yeah. Looking at some contrarian uh, <laughs> opinions, uh, Janet Maslin of the New York Times criticised the film's animation, although she later went on to say that the film is a fond tribute to the Looney Tunes character's past. Michael Wilmington of the Chicago Tribune complained about some aspects of the movie, stating we don't get the co-star's best stuff, Michael doesn't soar enough, the Looney Tunes don't pulverise us the way they did when Chuck Jones, Frizz Freeling and Bob Clampett were in charge. Yet overall, he still liked the film, saying, is it cute? Yes. Is it crowd-pleaser? Yup. Is it a classic? No, though it could have been. TV Guide gave the movie only two stars, calling it a cynical attempt to cash in on the popularity of Warner Brothers cartoon characters and basketball player Michael Jordan, inspired by a Nike commercial. That's true, I don't know if you know it that. Is, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. originally a Nike commercial. Well, uh, this director, and, as I looked up, had basically only really done music videos before. He'd done one feature film in the late 80s. Yeah. And that was about it. Everything was, like, including the night commercial. The night commercial this is based on. Yeah. He did. He also did a follow-up night commercial on Pepsi commercials. Okay. That uh, cashed in on this premise. So basically, his career in the mid to late 90s was all Space Jam related. Yeah. And finally... Uh, veteran Looney Tunes director Chuck Jones was critical of the film and its premise, opining that Bugs Bunny would not have enlisted help from others in resolving a conflict. Uh, it also won a Grammy Award. I mean, to be fair, though, there would have been no film. Yeah, exactly. Like, d d sometimes yeah, he's, he's got a problem with the very base premise, hasn't he? Yeah, but I mean, even then, like, it, then you'd basically have to go, well, then Bugs Bunny can't be part of the resolution. Yeah. Or just, or what he clearly wants is a Looney Tunes only film with no Michael Jordan. Yeah, but the problem. But Mike, no one would have watched that at the time. No, Looney also, Tunes were basically dead by the 90s. Yeah, they were revived by this film and Tiny Toon Adventures. Mm. And even then, I mean, that revival didn't last. No, 2003 killed it off when they did Looney Tunes back in action. Yeah, and even then, let's be honest, Michael Jordan was the main draw for this era. And. The main issue wasn't the Looney Tunes themselves, it was the Monstars, in my opinion. And last little thing, uh, it also won a Grammy Award and the MTV Movie Award for Best Song for the song I Believe I Can Fly. Which is the wrong song. Oh. It should have been Space Jam that won the award. And you are wrong because it's a way better song than that Space Jam song. Uh, but yes, R. Kelly, R. Kelly's a terrible person. I Believe I Can Fly is a great song. I mean, yeah. uh, so Space Jam was one I chose. I chose to do this as the finale because uh, I saw this as a kid and liked it as a kid um, and haven't really seen it ever since. Right. And it's obviously got a very fond, nostalgic memory yeah. for a lot of millennials. 
And then they did a sequel a couple years ago, which is apparently absolute dog shit. It looked dog shit from the trailers, which is why I did not go to see it. I mean, to be fair, this is not a great film. No, no, but the memory was that it was a good film. So Uh, this has nostalgia on its side. Do you think that may also happen for Space Jam 2? I doubt it because this had a positive reaction, as we've just heard. At the time. There was a positive reaction at the time. Right. I don't think there was a single positive reaction I heard to Space Jam 2. No. Space Jam 2, at best, might get a, a revival a la Super Mario Brothers 93, uh, if it's lucky. Yeah. And it may not even get that. Yeah. Because it's not even an original idea. It's just a rip-off of something yeah. that already existed. Yeah. Uh, so I decided to stick it in. You mentioned that you'd never seen it, so I thought, great, this would make a great season finale. Yeah, it's one I've always wanted to see um, because obviously I was it, I was the right age for it at the time. My parents wouldn't let me watch it because it's just... I, I, number one, we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up, so going to the cinema was very rare and my parents didn't want to waste money on something that was obviously capitalist garbage. Yeah. Oh, to be fair, I just want to be clear, I didn't see it at the cinema. For this, I bought the Blu-ray, and then I come around to Jamie's. I've got it on the hard drive for him, and he's like, we'll watch this in sweet, sweet VHS 240i. uh, Do you think it was 240? No, well, I think it was 240p. If it's 480p, then it's heavily crushed on the bitrate. Who could possibly care? I care! I brought you the HD copy! Was the film visible? Nearly! It was visible. Nearly. We saw everything that happened. Not so really. So stop moaning. No. It was free. <laughs> it's there. Anyway. Pretentious is the word you're looking for. No, pretentious is not the word Pretentious is definitely the word you're looking for. No, it's not. Pedantic is the nice word you're looking for. No, that's not right either. It was free. It was there for you. It was free for me. But mine was better. Anyway, so for those who don't know, uh, and anyone who hasn't seen the film yet and cares about spoilers, turn off now, because I'm about to spoil the plot to Space Jam. Uh, Basically, you are giving it a lot more... (laughs) That's why I said plot. That's why I said plot the way I did, (laughs) with the the verbal air quotes. More like plop. Um, So basically... Michael Jordan is a super successful basketball player, decides randomly that he's going to take a break and go play baseball instead. That's a terrible idea. And anyone who knows reality knows that that was a terrible idea because he was a terrible baseball player. Meanwhile, in outer space, which is cartoon land, there is a space amusement park called Moron Mountain that is run by Danny DeVito's alien character who's a cigar-chomping, fat executive type. And basically the kids at the theme park are like, this theme park's lame, don't ever bring me here again. And he's like, we need something, man. We need something to keep people coming to the park. And he decides they need something loony. So he decides he's going to enslave the Looney Tunes. Now, here's where we get to the first mind-boggling part of this movie. So you have our Earth, which is reality, supposedly. Michael Jordan exists. Our space... Is a cartoon land where yep. Moron Mountain is. Looney Tunes land, which is obviously also cartoon space, is in the centre of the Earth. But that must itself have a cartoon space because it must, at the very least, have a cartoon Mars because Marvin the Martian exists. And he's in this film. And he's in this as a Looney Tune. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you can see a sky when they're down there as well. Yes. You can see a blue sky. So, so, so what? <laughs> it, it would have been better if they make it made it multidimensional. Because yes. it would make as much sense, but actually probably a bit more, because then you don't have this issue. Also, it, it, they circumvent what would have been an interesting idea, that actually cartoon space is almost all of reality. And the human, the space that we all inhabit in humanity is a small pocket between the two worlds. Yeah, we're just the weirdos. Yeah, that we're the freaks, not the cartoon world. Yeah. Well, they do, they do, you get one joke that capitalises on that, which is when when Michael Jordan tells them he needs them to go to his house yeah. to get his sneakers, and Daffy Duck breaks the fourth wall and goes, to the 3D world? Yeah. 
and spits all over the camera. Did you notice that? Yeah, I, I thought that was... Animated that... spit on the lens. Yeah, and I always kind of wondered if that was meant to be like for 3D glasses effect, but I don't believe this film ever came out no, in 3D. No, it never came out in 3D. That was just a sort of breaking the fourth wall type thing, right. which the Looney Tunes themselves do a few times. Yeah. Um, and I'm telling you now, there's a couple of times Michael Jordan does it. Yeah, he just <laughs> and looks I at the camera. And I don't think they're intentional when Michael Jordan does it. No, I don't think they are either. It's obviously intentional when Bugs Bunny does it. Of course. Because he actually talks to the audience as well, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, these little teeny tiny aliens turn up in Looney Tunes land and are like, oh, we're going to enslave you all and force you to work in Moron Mountain. And Bugs Bunny pulls a trick where he... He, he gets a book that's how to draw cartoons and he crosses out the title and changes it to how to capture cartoons. Yep. And he adds a page in that says you have to give them a, a chance. And he tells them it's the rule book and because they believe it's the rule book, they agree to it because Looney Tunes logic. Yeah. So they say, okay, what chance do you want? And looking at the aliens and going, oh, well, they're all very teeny tiny. They're all like the size of Tweety Bird. Yeah. Uh, he thinks, oh, a smart thing to do is challenge them to a basketball game. Which at the time seems like a smart decision. Except it's then revealed in the next scene that none of the Looney Tunes know how to play basketball. No. But also that these beings can take powers from people in the real world. So then, yes, then the the beings go and take the talent of five top NBA players who I didn't know because I'm not a sportsy person. One of them was Charles Barkley. Uh, one of them was Muggsy Bogues, I think his name was. They go and steal the talent. They turn into big hulking monsters. Ha, huh, pun. Um, and they challenge them to a basketball game. We have an original animated character in this, which is Lola Bunny. Yes. And Rory, let's skip ahead to the sequel. We're obviously not talking about the sequel, but when the sequel came out, Lola Bunny reprised her role. Yep. And... It turned out people were people had a bit of an attachment to Lola Bunny, didn't they? Well, they had an attachment to certain assets of Lola Bunny. Um, that were then removed for the sequel. Yeah, they, they decided to de-sexify her. Um, honestly, when they when people talk about this... Because I, I, when, this, when the second film came out, I hadn't seen either film. I thought it was a bit weird that people were so desperate to see a sexy Lola Bunny... But I thought, okay, it could be that it's just a bit absurd that they just decided to blandify her characters. Because everything has to try and really pass a silhouette test. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously there's always the concern that when you reduce and change a character's attributes, you might then end up failing that silhouette test. The thing is, I, I didn't care either way. It was just an odd bit. But then when I watched this film, I realised that Lola Bunny has no character arc, no story... It's literally just, here's a chick with a slim waist, big, well, sizable boobs and swinging hips. But she's an animated and rabbit. And don't forget her ears flop over her face like hair. Yes. And she, she sexily flips her hair. See, I don't, ha- I don't have a problem with them playing the don't sort of... Don't call me doll. I don't have a problem with them playing her sex appeal for Bugs Bunny. Mm. In the that That's fine. But when you're introducing a new character... Give her a story? Make yeah, her relevant? But to be fair, none of the Looney Tunes have an arc. No, that's none true of enough. Them. And, and I think that's kind of the point, is because Looney Tunes don't change, even in the original Looney Tunes show. No. They don't, because it's all it's more sketch comedy, isn't it, yeah. the Looney Tunes show? However... As one episode would be made up of, like, yeah. three or four shorts. Yeah. How many times does Wile E. Coyote use dynamite, get blown up by his own TNT, or fall yeah. off of a mountain paint, and paint the, outside and then fall? Uh, paints a no. tunnel, and the Roadrunner runs through it, but then when he tries to run through it, he can't. Yeah, they cause... do that gag here, and again, I appreciated yeah. it. Yeah, that's Cool. He, he pulls down a, a sheet that's got a picture of a, a, a hole. Or something, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like a hole in the wall. And I think I think it is Roadrunner, isn't it? He runs yeah. through it. Wiley e. Coyote tries to, and he hits a solid wall, and yeah. it wraps him back up. Um, what? So let, let's get to this. So, then. Well, let's just say, can, can, finish the Lola Bunny thing. Yeah. Why? Now you know me, Rory. You know I'm a sick, sick pervert. <laughs> I love sexiness in movies. Mm. Love it. But she's the but, only female but character. But this is a child. This is a children's film. Yep. That fair enough. Okay. Yes, you're going to have parents taking the children. 
Yeah, but hopefully not cracking one off in the but cinema. why would you choose to make the sex appeal of... If you're going to have sex appeal... Having said why that, would it make? Why would you make it an animated bunny? Okay. That's even worse than Roger Rabbit. Yeah, yeah. At least in Roger Rabbit, it's an animated human woman. Yeah, yeah. But he, yeah, but then again, you're you're looking at a children's film where you've got someone who's designed specifically to be sexy hot, um, which is a weird thing if you think about it to put in a children's film. Oh, definitely, it's a um, weird thing. Um, definitely, it's I a mean, weird I thing. I couldn't care less either way. Uh, but no, I, it was just weird the reaction when they desexified her for Space Jam. But then, too. if it, I, I can understand why, in a weird way, because in this film there is nothing more to Lola Bunny than her just yeah. being sex appeal. So if you remove the sex appeal, she literally has no character. Yeah, she literally isn't. She shouldn't even exist because that's the only that seems to be make a bunny and make it sexy was all that they got I am and that's fi- all they gave I am fairly certain she only exists in the first place because the lo- they realized that the looney tunes had exactly one female and, and it's it was a granny, granny. <laughs> yeah. yeah um is tweety a girl or nope. is Oh, is he not? Tweety's a boy. Okay. I told Idora Puddy Tat. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about this then, because obviously we're talking about the how paper thin the story development, etc., is of mm. the Looney Tunes. One of the main issues is it's it's stated in the film, and I'm sure this is a hundred percent accurate to the actual real life sport. They play like a black and white tape of all white male basketball players. <laughs> mm. It's very reminiscent. Obviously, this came first. Yeah, but it's reminiscent of the tape from Dodgeball, isn't yeah. it? Where Hank Azaria is like dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. Um, yeah, it's take but- a break from that fine lead based paint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this isn't funny the way that it is in Dodgeball, but. It's stated in that video that each... It's five each, on five. It's five on five, unlike all the other... It specifically states, unlike soccer or unlike football, unlike this, unlike that, it's only five aside. So, and we have five Monstars, and it's always the same five. Yeah. But they we, never sub anyone in or anything like that. No, they just keep playing. When we get to the big match, at one, there's one shot where I counted 14 active Space Jam... Looney, Looney Tunes, Tunes members, including Michael Jordan. Yeah. Um, and this is before Bill Murray joins the team, and this is before uh, Wayne Knight joins the team. Yeah. So there's still people who get added in, yeah. and this isn't even all of them. There were some that you see later in the uniforms who weren't playing during that se- that yeah. part of the scene. So you're like, there's at least 14 players on one side, yeah. and they just get in school. You're like, how are you getting schooled when you got... More than you've got nearly three times the amount of team members than should be I, legal. I am fairly certain all the rules of basketball get ignored in the match. I'm pretty sure people are. You know, I'm pretty sure there's a bit where people are traveling with the ball. Yeah. You're not allowed to do that. Um, I'm pretty sure you're not allowed in basketball to jump on the heads of other people. I definitely know you're not allowed to strap dynamite to the opposing team's hoop no. and blow them up. <laughs> Wiley Coyote, <laughs> or or paint their butt red to attract a ball. Yeah, from the audience. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, those things are inherent to the Looney Tunes universe. Yeah. But the 14v5 is not inherent to the Looney Tunes universe, nor is it inherent to the no. rules of basketball. No. It seems to... Like, the thing is, the paper-thin characterization would have been made better had they picked five Looney Tunes yeah. and gone with it. Even if you had That's five the problem, plus isn't Michael it? Jordan. Is that, that the problem is they're trying to give each of the big Looney Tunes a shining moment. But make them extras. Um, that's what I'm saying. Though. Yeah. They're, try- they're trying to give them all a top moment. And it's like, you can't do that. You have to pick... Five. Yeah. They could have done that. Have a but... substitution. Yeah. Have one get injured and then substitute them. Yeah. But they don't even do that because they don't keep track of injuries. No. Because for most of the game, injuries that are received don't last. Yeah. That, and then like, all it, of a sudden... It's like when... cartoon logic. You get flattened and then you get back up and you're... Well, Wiley Coyote gone. gets literally dismembered at one point. Yeah, he turns into like six pieces, And it's he? fine. But then in the next scene, after he's just been run over, <laughs> he's funny. in... No, Bugs, after that, it's immediately after that, he gets dismembered into like six pieces. Oh, and then the Bugs Bunny gets Bugs. sat, set yeah. down on, and then Lola runs up and goes, oh no, Bugs. And he's like, oh, my dying, I'm dying. It's like, you've just been set. He was in six pieces yeah. five seconds. Bugs, <laughs> Bugs takes a frog splash for her, doesn't he? Though, when we it, when it gets towards sort of the tentative part of the match, what is quite funny um, is how extreme the injuries are. 
like Foghorn Leghorn is literally a cooked chicken. Yeah, with <laughs> that blood, did make me laugh. Having a blood transfusion. <laughs> to be fair, that did make me laugh. That yeah. was funny. But it was just like, the, the injuries were really too extreme. Yeah. <laughs> Tweety Pie is in a, what was it? A, a An deep... iron lung. Yeah. And he's not in it because he's very small, isn't he, Tweety yeah. Pie? If you look, his entire body just fits on the pillow outside of the iron lung. Oh. So the iron lung is there for no reason. <laughs> Um, which is quite funny. Yeah. Um, it's and this is the thing. Maybe we're applying too much logic to a film that is, you know, based yeah. on a commercial <laughs> and is for children. Um, one thing. So there's. But a it would have made it better in terms of character development and yes. plot. Now, things I did not like, definitely did not like in this movie. I understand it's 1996. I understand animation technology is not where it is now. My God, my God, when they try to apply cartoon physics to the real actors oh, what, it is they... a surreal nightmare every time so the first time is when they fold michael jo- the monsters yeah, yeah, fold yeah. michael jordan into a ball yeah. like a scene from hellraiser oh mate it's, it's um, horrific honestly it reminded me of and it's not even that bad there's a film called wishmaster 2 right <laughs> wishmaster 2 <laughs> has andrew divoff in it and there's a scene in Wishmaster 2 where a... So, uh, basically, Wishmaster is about an evil genie. And right. it's, a, it's a very typical be careful what you wish for narrative. And in, in Wishmaster 2, he deliberately gets himself arrested. Because who, where else in the world are more people going to be making wishes than prison? Right. So he, he meets this criminal and he's like, oh, you know, you could wish for anything. And this criminal's like... Okay, then, I wish I could uh, walk right through these bars. And the djinn folds him up into a tiny little package and slots him through the bars. Right. Uh, another guy, and this is one... That one works, to be fair, because you could crush someone like that if you were an all-powerful genie demon thing. Um, what, the, <laughs> one that, the one that does not work, because biologically it literally doesn't work... Um, Rachel's boss from Friends is in it. Right. Um, the, her boss when she gets to Ralph Lauren. Yeah. The one who accidentally kisses her. Yes. He plays one no, of the... No, she kisses him. She kisses him. He plays one of the lawyers and th- this prisoner's wishes that his lawyer would go fuck himself. <laughs> oh, no. And the scene goes like this. By the way, I'm sorry if there's any children listening because it's a Space Jam episode. We're not talking about Space Jam anymore. <laughs> turn off. If you're, I don't think we're if you're, in Kansas If you're below the age of 18, turn off. The lawyer, played by that guy, is sitting... Is it Mr. Zellman or something like that? Zellman. He's sitting there, and he falls forward onto the desk. His legs, which are obviously prosthetic, come up behind him. You see them rotate, so his spine snaps. Right. His own legs fold over his back and start going up and down, and he starts making noise like, oh, oh, oh. And there's like a noise like he's getting fucked. Let me tell you why that doesn't work. <laughs> the gin has just rotated his pelvis, <laughs> which means that the dick and the ass are still on the other side of each other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when you watch it, as an image, you're just like, ha, that's funny. He wished he'd go fuck himself and he is. And then you spend literally a one second of thought on it and you're like, hang on, that doesn't work. Anyway. My point was, them folding Michael Jordan up into a basketball looks exactly as horrific as this. They don't stick Michael Jordan's penis up his bum hole. No, but they do <laughs> decide to do a fucking close-up of his face, oh, mate, badly that's... animated, being like... Honestly, oh. it's nightmare fuel. And There's then... a lot of weird close-ups of Michael Jordan in yeah, this. For some reason, the camera is always way too close to Michael Jordan. Do you reckon that's just because they didn't? Have, they ran out of time to green screen a whole set behind him? So they're just like, keep the camera close. <laughs> close as you can get it. Maybe. Um, so that's the first horrifying effect. The second, re- I mean, then there's an effect that's not horrifying. It's just bad where the dog's really big. We'll come back to that. Yeah. The second really horrifying body horror effect Wayne is, th- yeah. So after they've done the, the flattening Bugs Bunny under a monster gimmick, yeah. they decide to repeat the same joke with live action Wayne Knight. Yes. And this, this is a body horror nightmare. David Cronenberg probably ejaculated in his shorts when he watched Space Jam <laughs> and probably got jet probably the reason he stopped doing body horror movies was he watched this and went I can't top that I can't beat it <laughs> and that's why existence was shit yeah 
I can't beat it. I can't do that. This thing, like, it, it's Wayne Knight flattened, and they go and put an air pump in his mouth, yeah. and his eyes are moving, so, like, he's still alive. Yeah. And they pump him up, but they over pump him. And he becomes so he's a, a big balloon. balloon man. Man, you know what? There's some deviant art nerds who are jacking <laughs> off to this. To Wayne Knight? To inv- well, it's where inflation porn people love to live, oh, isn't it? It's is deviant it? art. Mm. Oh, oh, God, he's going to pop! <laughs> Is I popping really it. a thing that people... Yes. Do you not know about popping? I do not want to know about popping. Let's move oh, on. Oh, Rory, you no. naive son I, of a bitch. I, when I heard of body popping, I, I thought it was dancing. I did I not think how, it was... I, I love how childishly naive you are. It is both your most endearing and most repulsive quality at the same time. <laughs> Anywho, so that's the really horrific effects. But in terms of camera work, as we said, there's also some weird things with that one of which is the excessive amount of close-ups of michael jordan yep and second of all is the use of a particular shot mostly associated with horror that is overused to the extreme in this movie in fact it's it's used so much that it feels like it's a mistake and what what angle yeah yeah the tripod leg was broken yeah it like yeah dutch angles they're everywhere yeah now dutch angles are an important it can be used incredibly well in film. Um, I believe Predator utilizes them in very good ways, things like that. A lot of horrors of Evil the 80s Sam did. Raimi loves them. Yeah, and the, the good basically what a Dutch angle is is when the camera suddenly goes off kilter, almost like you've turned it diagonally to make the environment and the location and everything else feel a bit off base, like it doesn't feel right. Now, you utilise that in a point where either a realisation is hitting someone or, or something is going bad. So, yeah, or something surreal's happening, yeah. something where you're losing touch with reality. It actually makes sense in this film when Michael Jordan first goes to Toonland. Yes. Then it makes sense because you're like, oh, yeah, this is Michael Jordan's, like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah, he's, sort of he's completely off kilter because he doesn't know what's going on. He didn't even know this was a real place. So that makes sense. But when he, it's, it happens at the very end, after they've won the basketball match, he's celebrating with all of the space jammers. And it just, the camera is pissed the whole time. And he's sitting there going, hey guys, I'm glad we did this. We, we all did a great job, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, why are we Dutch right now? I don't understand. Why are we Dutch at the point where the equilibrium has been restored? Yeah. Where, you know, they've won, it's happy ending, everything's fine. Yeah, and that's that's when it feels like mistakes were made, or there were errors, or something they were trying to cut just, out of the just frame. just poor choices. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, our, in our opinion, obviously. Yeah. Another to be po- fair, this dude has made a far more successful movie than any of, than either of us ever have, so... Yeah, um... I'll tell you what was also a big mistake in this film, and people, people will probably fight me on this, um, and it's not that I dislike him either... But Bill Murray in this film is a big mistake. Um, agreed, agreed. I, what the fuck's ca- he doing here? Yeah, he, he he's playing it like, oh, I'm just a guy. Oh, I don't really care. You know, blah, blah, blah. But because of the type of film it is, it feels like he shouldn't be there. It feels like literally they, they found Bill Murray on the golf course and he's just like, oh, whatever, but I don't care. Did you not notice that for a period in Bill Murray's career... That was his career, was yeah. turning up in cameo roles in films he had no business being in. Yeah. He doesn't need to be in Zombieland. I know a lot of people no. fondly remember that bit, yeah. but he doesn't need to be there. He doesn't need to be in here. And I'm going to be honest, and I know this is, I know I'm in the minority here, but he's, I've, I do not find Bill Murray funny. Okay. Never have. Uh, see, I'm, I, I don't have that negative a reaction to Bill Murray. Um, I didn't enjoy Groundhog Day, but then I don't tend to like looping films. Right. Um, whereas I liked him in Ghostbusters. He's still not my favourite character even in Ghostbusters, but, you know, I'd like him in Ghostbusters. I like him in different things. I thought he was quite good, actually, in Zombieland, even though I think that film is wildly overrated. The... This particular cameo... His character does basically nothing of consequence until the end, when all of a sudden he's brought in as a substitute fifth player when he, they he's suddenly need one. Machina, isn't he? Yeah. He turns up and he goes, da, 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 da. I, I can't even do it. He does the Warner Brothers Looney yeah. Tunes thing. That's it. And the only meta joke you get, which, you know, children, this would go well over children's head, yeah. is when they say to him, how did you get down here? He just goes, oh, the producer's a friend of mine. Yeah. And it's Ivan Reitman. Which is Ivan Reitman, the director of Ghostbusters. Yeah. And it's like, 
I think also the director of Groundhog Day, actually. No, that was, uh, that was Harold, Harold Ramis, Ramis. Yeah. who plays Egon in Ghostbusters. Yes, because uh, that's it, because Groundhog Day is the film where they fell out, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't need that joke. <laughs> that's not a good enough joke to, to justify his appearance for me. No, um, it, it also, there was, bear in mind they had like 14 other players at least. They could have substituted him with someone else. Or they could have, when they did the whole bit where Bugs Bunny got properly injured, he could have been out of the game, and then this would have been his point to come back into the game. There was a million different ways they could have played it. But instead, they introduce a character who doesn't need to be here, who's not even in basketball, and I know that's meant to be the joke, but we're already doing that with the Looney Tunes. So yeah. it's no like it's not like we're watching four other top basketball players fight against the monsters, and suddenly here comes Bill Bloody Murray. Yeah, we're watching people who are shit at basketball, and here comes someone who's shit at basketball. That doesn't add to the joke. No, um, no. So let's talk yeah. about things that do work in the film. Um, some of the comedy does work. Um, Nearly mm. all of it is the Looney Tunes stuff. Pretty much nothing with live action people lands no. at all. No. And even the Looney Tunes stuff kind of only works because it's calling back to the nostalgia of the classic Looney Tunes gags. Yeah. So it's stuff like uh, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck are in a dark tunnel and it does that animation trick where the whole screen's black except for their eyes. They disagree on which way to go. Daffy Duck goes off on his own and is like, hmm, I should be here right about now. Lights up his lighter and boom, he's in the doghouse. Yeah. That's a joke that's been done a billion times in Looney Tunes. Yeah. Um, things like Bugs Bunny re the, you know, getting out of it by writing the rule book. Yeah. And it's clearly fake, but they fall for it. These are not revolutionary jokes. They're not laugh at even for 1996. Like putting myself back into 1996. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these not... have been done a million times throughout well, Lo Looney Tunes. Existence. When you think Looney Tunes have been around since what the 1940s, I think they started at the very least. Yeah, definitely the 50s. They were like that was like oh, the they height were of their. The right there, yeah. you go. Then um, I think some of them may even have it. been the 30s. Yeah, that's, some that's of the, the bit where ones. I was unsure was if any existed in the 30s. Um, the point is they've been around a long time. Yeah. So all um, to be fair, it's hard to come up with new jokes when you've done so many shows over so many years. Yeah. Um, some of these jokes have been done better in old Looney Tunes. Some of them felt I don't know. It, uh, there was a bit of a I don't know if they're staccato or what, but there's something about them where they just don't seem to have the right comedic timing that they needed to have in order to land some of them. Um, some of them are overdone as well. But there's in... some bit where the sound editing is really bad yeah. because the mu there's music playing and the music is so loud over the Looney Tunes doing their thing yeah. that it actually distracts you from the punchline or from the action. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I did like, and one of the biggest problems with this film is that they don't do more of it, is when Daffy and Bugs go to Michael Jordan's house to pick up his shoes... When they're in the house, they get they go to his trophy room. They're opening like cabinets and moving chairs. And shit, yeah. They don't do a much of it, sadly, but those bits are really well done because yeah. it makes them feel like they're in the world. Yeah, it's somehow more impressive putting cartoon people in the real world and having them interact with real objects than, than, it, is, Michael than it is having Michael Jordan interact with cartoon objects. Well, it's because all you need to do is slap him on a green screen and the animators will do the rest. Whereas yeah. by having having animated characters interact with real world objects I means you actually have to put some thought process into how those objects are going to be interacted with how yeah. are you going to hide the fact that there's either someone or some pulley string or pulley. object system pulling those items around yeah um and that makes it more impressive and immediately makes them feel more like they're there yeah um if the film was a little bit more in the real world, that might have been more impressive, but yeah. it probably would have wrapped the budget. But even then, 78 million in the mid-90s was huge. Oh, this was a huge film. Yeah. Um, so something that my memory was wrong on was I, I definitely remember Danny DeVito's character being in this film a lot more than he actually is. Yeah, he's he, kind of a glorified I, cameo as I, well, I, really. I, I reckon they had him for a day. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon so. And all, he does a good job. all voice Danny, lines. Yeah. Danny DeVito always... Always gives you what you ask for. Mm. So but a year after this, literally a year after this, Hercules, he would he? do a much better voice performance as Philip Titi's in 
Hercules. But again, I don't think his voice performance is the problem. No, he's not the problem. No, there, there, it's there's just not better much, character. Yeah, there's not much character or, or development or anything for his because he's barely in it. He's just kind of there for when the monsters yeah. start to lose. He goes, right, you guys need to win now. And then they yeah. do. And there's no reason for them to suddenly be better. They've just been told to be better and they do it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the power of belief. Is it? Maybe. Jay, that... Um, this film, so <laughs> I was surprised how little the nostalgia affected me as well. Bear in mind, I saw this as a kid. I thought I would have a lot of nostalgia for it. Right. Um, I actually didn't. I was hoping to get a massive nostalgia hit because even though I didn't see it. You knew Looney Tunes. I knew Looney Tunes. I'd seen loads of press about it during the time because, again, I was 10. I was the target audience. And I really wanted to see it. Also, the music in it, pretty much all of it are bangers that I I own and listen to regularly, including do, do, the Space do, Jam do, thing. Do, 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 yeah. do, 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 techno- uh, It had... Was it Technotronic? Anyway, it's got, techno- it's got Technotronic in it. It's, you know, all of these house tunes that I have and mm. listen to on the regular. Right. So, including the Space Jam theme itself, um, I've got the whole album by that artist. I can't remember their name, the life of me right now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, so I do listen to this stuff. I felt like I'd get not necessarily first wave, but like second hand nostalgia yeah. from recognizing these things. And I did a little, but it wasn't enough to give the movie any more shine. Right. Um, and something that I'll be honest, there is something that I always thought even back in the day about the animation. That is still a problem for me now. Um, to me, it was always very obvious that when they shaded the characters, yeah. They were utilizing a really early, very basic form. Probably, I used to use it in Macromedia Fireworks. Uh, that's how old it is. You know, Macromedia Fireworks doesn't exist as a thing anymore. Um, but it was a graphics editing suite, kind of a bit like Photoshop of its yeah. time. Uh, and based, you can do this in Photoshop nowadays. You'll find it very easily in the settings. It's emboss. In order yeah. to make the uh, characters seem more like they're there, they emboss them, but it's like a, a an overly smooth type of gloss yeah. to give them a fake shine on one side and a darkness on the, the other. other yeah. um, but it's really lazy, and I don't think it looks very good. No, and I, I, mean, I won't time, lie. I won't lie. In the 90s, that really worked for me. One of the things that blew me away about Space Jam when I was a kid was obviously the Looney Tunes in the TV show mm. don't have that. They're very flat, 2D, solid color yeah. um i had the same thing with but i find it I weird think that i didn't like it in the 90s i think it's scooby-doo on zombie island where yeah. they, they actually it was the first time in scooby-doo they went to the effort of putting shading in oh, okay um and both both that and space jam i remember being like oh the characters look weird i can't think why and then i was like oh shit they've got shading yeah. so that that worked for me as a kid as for now it, it didn't ruin the film like i wasn't sat there distracted by it yeah um, I was more distracted by how none of the art, by how a lot, not none of, it's unfair of me to say none of, a lot of the time the eye lines don't match when it's yeah. a human character talking to the yeah. Looney Tunes, uh, you're a bit, which I think is another reason there's so many close-ups yeah. of human characters, it's so they don't have the to deal with the eye lines. Yeah, yeah. Because um, like Wayne Knight, when the monsters catch him, in the, he's looking entirely the wrong direction. He's looking... They've obviously put the camera on a crane and brought it down to get him, you know, looking right up. But it's meant to be Danny DeVito's character he's looking at. Yeah. Who's about the same height as Wayne Knight. Yeah. Like, yeah. that'd make more sense if he was looking up at the other monsters. Yeah. But he's meant to be looking at Danny DeVito. Yeah, I reckon that in the initial... When they filmed the live-action pieces, it wasn't Danny DeVito that was there. <laughs> And then they changed it in the animation stage. But obviously you can't change the footage you've got. No. Um, certainly not in 96. Yeah, but I remember in 96 disliking the shading style. Right. I was like, I like shading. I like when, you know, but I like it to be hand drawn through. Yeah. Um, and it felt cheap. Um, and I remember that it being 10 years old and going, why is, I really wanted to love it because it was the big thing. And I was like, I like Pepsi. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> and Michael Jordan is a big name, and I love the Looney Tunes. And but just thinking the shading looked cheap. I don't know why. Um, and that well, I, as I got older, obviously learned more about mm. shading techniques and figured out exactly what it is that I didn't like. Yeah. Um, but yeah. 
we so one thing we've not talked about we talked about eyelines not matching up we talked about shading we talked about all this stuff sometimes things aren't correct like aren't in proportion to other things throughout the whole film the biggest the version of this is the dog so we first see the dog before michael jordan goes to uh looney tunes world yeah and it's and, just a dog yeah it's like a bulldog it's a bulldog yeah, yeah. it's a bulldog it's got a big head small body uh, but it runs up to him uh, and licks his face. Yeah. And then, and you can see the size of it. It's about the size of a human torso. Yeah, it's the size of a bulldog. Yeah. Um, when Daffy goes into its uh, dog, house. dog house, it seems a little big, but it's like, you can understand why, because he's in a, meant to be in an enclosed yeah. space. Fine. But when they're actually in the house and stealing stuff from the trophy room, the Daffy opens the door to the dog. The dog is a... Well, the dog's bigger than the door frame. The dog is the size of Godzilla. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. Like, its whole it's face obviously is been, wider than the door Because it's obviously been filmed separately and yeah. then green screened in, hasn't it? Yeah, but and they the had no idea of how to do it relative wrong. to size. Yeah. Um, and then when it pushes through the door and stands on, like, the basically the door falls on Daffy Dark and it's standing on yeah, the door. Yeah, this, this dog knocks this entire door off its hinges. Yeah. No wonder they put it in the doghouse. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? How? Yeah. How? Yeah. I don't know. But it's because it's a giant dog. But that's mm. never stated again. Like, the, the giant no. dog comes in, terrorises them for a bit. Michael mm. Jordan's three kids come and go, oh, don't yeah. worry, we got the dog. And in, guys those, go. and in those scenes, the dog is normal size again. Yeah, in relative to them. And walks off, like, but Daffy and Bugs aren't yeah. tiny compared to the kids. No, because we know that later when they're stood next to Michael Jordan. Yeah. So it's so, like, uh, there's no... And, and also, they're tall enough to reach the doorknobs and stuff at almost normal height. Yeah. So, it's, it, this makes no sense. And it can't be considered to be this was an afterthought scene, because it's the, the story doesn't work without it. So, it's clearly pre-considered. What happened to the dog animations that made them have to cheap out like this? I mean, the blue screen is also terrible as well. Yeah. It's clearly blue screen. Uh, no, it might be green screen. Cause it's there's... green screen. If yeah. you look at the making of it's all yeah, green. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, because there's a lot of blue... There's too much blue left on the dog, actually. There is there is a bit in, in the behind the scenes, this is literally a bit where Michael Jordan's playing basketball, and it's just him on a green set with a bunch of people all in green. <laughs> and you're like, fucking, I bet Michael Jordan still, ha- still wakes up in the night shivering, dreaming be about being attacked by a horde of green people. I don't think there's much more to say, to be honest. Yeah. It's a, it's disappointing the film doesn't live up to the nostalgia, but then again, that is the essence of nostalgia, is that often it doesn't live up to yeah. what we remember. Yeah. Because we remember it through a rose-tinted glass. Well, you especially can never go back something... to the era and what you were feeling at the time, can you? No, so... and especially not when you were a fucking child. Yeah. Yeah, the simplicity and... and also, certain elements of this would have seen you... At the time, in a way that they are like green screening actors on such a big scale would have been pretty new, not completely new, but relatively new uh, in terms yeah. of its scale at the time. This was definitely the first film I saw because I didn't see Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Right. This was the first time I ever saw cartoons interacting with real people. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. But even so, like nowadays, green screening actors onto things. They basically name me a big budget movie that isn't just that. Now, that, now they do it when they don't even need to. Oh yeah, they're just like, oh, we can't be fucked to build a set green screen. Yeah, um, I I hate that. I do. I agree. <laughs> um, which probably sours this a little bit, not completely because it is of a different era, but it means that it's just kind of another one of this green screen fest. It's the herald. A what? It's the herald of the coming age. Oh, I see. Yes. Herald of Galactus. A harbinger, yes. Harbinger's a good word. I like the word harbinger. Yeah. Harbinger of doom. Um, I don't really have much more to say about Space Jam, actually. No, it was Uh, a relatively entertaining watch, but I would never watch it again unless I wanted to go back. Unless I was showing someone 90s cheese, then I might give it another whirl. Certainly hasn't got me stoked to see the sequel. I don't know about you. I mean, I wasn't stoked to see the sequel anyway because the the no. whole reason to want to watch this one was nineties nostalgia. Yeah, the, the new ain't, one no, ain't, that. ain't nobody got nostalgia for twenty twenty. <laughs> oh, fuck no! No, of all the years, that's not the one anyone's got nostalgia for. So that does it. That is the season finale 
of season one of Second Take Cinema. It is our last episode of the year 2023. Uh, we will be back in 2024 with a whole bunch of new films. We've got guests lined up. We had a, we, we've had like one guest episode this year where we had Benton and Dave on to talk about Halloween. Uh, but next year, we have got all sorts of guests lined up for you. We've got loads of exciting films ranging from uh, ranging from blockbusters and crowd pleasers all the way down to world cinema films and weird, freaky, artistic little things and just some fucking weird shit that I like and no one else could possibly care about. Uh, but yeah. So, Happy New Year, everybody. I uh, hope you celebrate in style, however you're celebrating. And until... 2024, it's goodbye from me, Jamie Evans. And me, Roy Johnson. Have a happy new year, and we will see you next time.